Cari amici, buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò. Uh, tonight is really my great pleasure to welcome Joe Shora to the Casa. And I have to say that in a very selfish way, it was my desire to have Joe here to talk about his book, listen to him and talk to him and engage him in a discussion. Um, uh, Joe Shora is one of the colleagues in New York that I respect the most uh, for his uh, many tasks and the many things that he has done and for the way in which he combines his job at the Calandra Institute with what in past times would have been called a militant intellectual. And he has the same um, honesty of heart and intellect that I recognize in the great spirits of uh, the Italian uh, 19th and 20th, and 20th century. And I see in him sort of a, the heir to that tradition, combining academic work with work in the field. And for us, the field is people. And um, today we present uh, Joe's book, Built with Faith, that is one of the many interests that he has, and it's uh, about the material culture of uh, Italian-American Catholics. And there are five case studies that he explores in this book, and he will tell us about it. And I find it fascinating the way in which, through the analysis of artifacts, artworks of very different kinds, and some of them we could consider very artistic, and some of them we could consider them very humble. It doesn't really matter where you rank them on the artistic level. Uh, what matters is that what they stand for in terms of uh, documenting the relationship of people towards the community in which they are born, they live, and in which they interact with uh, a variety of other people, even of other faiths and of other uh, cultural and national contexts. And uh, as a, a footnote, I would also say that uh, Joe, on top of writing Build with Faith, he every year builds with faith his own uh, personal contribution uh, with a faith in, 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 in a very open <laughs> sense of the word. Uh, he builds a fantastic presepio that I've never seen for real, but I follow through the uh, photographs and the documentation he provides on social media. And every year, and I think uh, his wife that is here tonight is also a witness that sometimes taking over large parts of the, of the house. And every year the presepio that, that Joe presents to me is a, is a further testament to the fact that he has not only studied from a scholarly point of view this tradition of building objects uh, within that perspective of faith in the larger sense of the world. Uh, and uh, also would like to ask him at the end of the talk, what is presepio for this year is going to be like and what the team is going to be like. And, um, and of course, presepio is, uh, by tradition, in the Catholic world, the most ancient example of uh, build thing. Uh, it starts with Francis of Assisi, that instead of using things, used real people. And he picked real poor people to interpret the characters in the scene of the nativity. And then it goes on with the tradition that, as we know, developed in, in very different ways in different parts of the world, particularly in Italy, but not only. So without further ado, I'm here to listen to uh, Joe Shora talk about his book, and I invite you to please welcome him with a warm applause. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. It's, it's always a pleasure to be here at the CASA for a number of reasons. One, of course, is to be introduced by Stefano with such gracious and warm words. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, as I've said before, I presented, um, I think last, just last month, a book on new Italian migrations to the United States with my colleague, Lauro Roberto. And um, the Casa really is this home for a lot of us who don't necessarily have a home in other institutions. The Calandria Institute is clearly one of those, but the CASA has, in its ecumenical um, way, under the direction of, of Stefano, has opened the doors to the CASA here, um, as I've said, in ways that other institutions haven't. And for that, I've, I'm always um, grateful, not only for myself and my own work, but for all of us as a community of artists, as scholars, um, and, those of, and New Yorkers. So what I'd like to do, this book is um, the result of just about 35 years of research. 
And I'm a folklorist by training, a cultural anthropologist, and also um, some work in art history. And I've been working in this book exclusively in New York City and looking at exclusively Italian Americans and their uh, traditional and invented art traditions. And we'll, I'll talk about a number of them. But my work is ethnographic. So what I do is I go out and meet with people, talk with people, observe what they're doing, um, and listen. I mean, a lot of what this job, my, this, this wonderful career that I've had, is simply listening to people. Because I think that the things that we see here, and I'll talk a little bit about it, are often dismissed as kitsch, um, as a banality, a spiritual banality. Um, um, but when you listen to people, you realize that, in fact, is not what it is at all. And so part of what this book um, attempted to do and what this research does uh, to a large degree is to simply give a voice to those people um, and a platform to show their artwork in ways that haven't been shown um, normally. So I do have a prepared statement. I'm going to read it. It's in 18 points, so it's not as thick as all this. So don't be uh, alarmed. So let me just meet Gino Vitale president of a development company that owns renovated and newly constructed rental properties in the ever gentrifying Brooklyn neighborhoods of Red Hook and Carroll Gardens. Having immigrated with his parents from the Sicilian town of Militello in 1977 at age five, Vitale is one of those dynamic forces refashioning a city from the ground up in a new cycle of capital investment and construction. But he differs from other developers in one fundamental way. Vitale caps the roof line of his newly constructed buildings with, arcu 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 with arched niches, <laughs> housing Catholic statuary inset to the facades. These shrines are versions of Edicole Sacre, wall shrines found throughout Italy. When I asked him why he created these devotional shrines in the facades of his buildings, Vitale answered, we come from a religious town. You know, we're religious people. It's like the house is blessed. On the other end of the borough, Angela Rizzi assembles her, assembles her domestic altar to St. Joseph for the Saint's March 19th feast day in the living room of her Sheepshead Bay home for over a quarter century. Angela's cloth-draped, tiered altar is decorated not with offerings of food as in the Sicilian American tradition, but with numerous vases of cut flowers. Loaves of blessed bread are piled on a white cloth at the foot of the altar and distributed to visiting family members, co-workers, and neighbors. Angela, who um, immigrated in 1971 at age 14 from Puglia and works as a cook in a local public school kitchen, inherited her devotion and sacramental art from her mother and her grandmother. The altar's importance has a char as a charged site of channel religious and familial sentiment was made evident when she became overwhelmed with emotion trying to explain to me St. Joseph's innumerable, innumerable miraculous interventions on her behalf and that of her family. Over the course of 130 years, Italian-American Catholics in New York City have developed a varied repertoire of devotional art and architecture to create community-accepted sacred spaces in their homes and neighborhood, spaces that exist outside of, but in relationship to, the consecrated halls of local parishes. Today, yard shrines, decorated altars, prasepi, or nativity creches, extravagant Christmas house displays, and a constellation of street feste, or religious feasts, and processions are examples of the vibrant and varied ways contemporary Italian Americans have used and continue to use material culture, architecture, ritual behavior, and public ceremonial display to shape New York City's religious, cultural, and ethnic landscapes. These expressions are vivid and creative ways in which personal devotion is publicly enacted and negotiated as long-standing and integral parts of the city's religious landscape. And that's what I'm particularly interested in this study, is looking at the way in which private, individual, and family-oriented religious vernacular arts are made an integral part of the city and how the city is made local, is in its local manifestations made integrated into the larger uh, network of New York. 
And this is not something unique to Italian Americans or to Catholics. It's happening everywhere throughout the city in which people are, are taking their local streets, their neighborhoods, to make New York their home. And this is just sort of one slice of that, um, of that phenomenon. So this coterie of objects and environments transform everyday urban space into unique communal points of religiosity and artistry. Urban residents' collective inscription of meaning and value on city space through public display, decoration, and identification, and vernacular architecture instills a sense of intimacy and identification with their immediate surroundings. These vernacular Catholic sites collectively bridge various spaces, home, front yard, street, neighborhood, borough, the city at large, and a global sites of transnational diaspora in social networks of Italian American religious practices. And I think this, I, I, I particularly like this photograph because I, I think it really exemplifies the ways in which New Yorkers, Italian Catholics in this case, have to negotiate the city. Um, this is the BQE through Williamsburg that uh, back in the, right after World War II cut through the neighborhood, destroyed homes, destroyed the church, but it's a, a, an ever-present aspect of the religious ways, the religious life of the Italian Catholics in that neighborhood. So Italian-American Catholics' relationship to their religious folk art has never been static, uh, but has changed since its transference from Italy to the United States. So I'm not, one of the things I'm not trying to do here is create a nostalgic picture of isn't it wonderful how the little old Italian lady is still having an altar? These things are dynamic and constantly changing. This is not the altars from 150 years ago. These are very different because of the ways, their own personal beliefs, their own personal interactions with their faith, their community, and their, their families and neighborhoods. So while some of the things, the elements are the same, um, an arched roof for an altar, a, a tablecloth uh, for uh, a, another type of altar. These things are constantly in changing, and it's only through the uh, conversations, the listening with people, do we get a better sense of how they've changed and what they mean to contemporary Italian American uh, Catholics. So in, New York City, in the New York City context, change has occurred as economic and political forces have altered the city itself and affected its residents. My ethnographic work shows some of the factors contributing to the modification and reinterpretation of these vernacular sites of worship in public spaces. And here I just want to show you a map of New York City and all the various neighborhoods that I've uh, visited and people that I've talked to um, in the five boroughs. So these are just some of the things that have changed over the course of uh, since World War II and up until the 21st century that has impacted the ways in which religious practices by Italian Catholics are uh, manifested. So one, the altering of Catholic aesthetics and a structure of feeling in the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 1965. The shifting demographics due to post-World War II migration of Southern blacks and Puerto Ricans, and the subsequent post-1964 immigration from Asia, the Caribbean, and Latin America, and the, ongo and the ongoing gentrification of the city. Italian Americans changing relationship to the urban built environment to notions of community life and to their spirituality is informed by these and other factors. As examples of Catholic sacramentals, this is a kind of you know, Catholic term, sacramental, these material objects and spaces are imbued with the power to make the divine present. They are vehicles for channeling, God, channeling God's presence or grace into the everyday world. The eminence of God, and most especially of the Virgin Mary and the saints in the material objects purchased and then transformed through artistry, is a dynamic principle for Italian-American Catholics. Their artistic engagement of assemblage, a construction, performance, display, and narration is an active force in not only revealing but making the divine present in the mundane world. And I think that is often the kind of thing that when in particular, journalists go in and look at something like this, or, or even some degree, art historians look at something like this. They don't see, they don't feel, they're not aware of the sacred power that emanates from an object like this. So religious authorities, cultural arbitrators, and journalists have tended to devalue or dismiss this rich legacy of urban ethnic landscapes and Catholic devotional vernacular artistry by deeming them unofficial, spiritually banal, de kitsch, 
quaint local col color, or all of the above. Many of these creative practices have failed to gain Italian-American Catholics any cultural capital, and thus the artistic creativity, ceremonial use, and symbolic import of such religious material culture for Italian-American Catholics are rarely given serious attention. I have to say that this week, the New York Times is in fact covering local Italian-American Prezepi builders in the Sunday Metropolitan section. So stay tuned, yes. Well, so I'm really excited because I've introduced, the, uh, yeah, so I introduced the journalist to a couple of, um, some of the people that you'll actually see here. So I'm very excited to, this Sunday. It might come out, I guess it'll come out, you know, online tonight or tomorrow. So, but it should be in the, the Metro section. So, I think this is where I'm at. While other Catholic communities in the United States build yard shrines, domestic altars, nativity landscapes, and stage religious processions, Italian Americans in New York City create religious objects and landscapes that display a noticeable style marked by personal and collective and identities and histories. This construction of style, that is, the process whereby objects are made to mean and mean again, to quote Dick Hibdige, and thus difference is instructive in understanding how individuals express themselves and constitute a community or a subculture of like-minded people. And this is Antonio Vigilante's Presepio, which is not in his home, but in a church out in Bensonhurst, uh, 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 St. Astanasius. It's worth the visit. It's by far one of the best sort of vernacular presepi in the city. It's really quite stunning. So an Italian-American style is achieved and reproduced through a series of interlocking components concerning aesthetic choices and philosophical um, positions. One, a profound respect for craft and skills executed well, a love of cement and stonework, a delight with the principles of accretion and the interplay of seeming contrast. When you put two objects together in a sort of collage and an assemblage, they may not necessarily make sense by themselves or in this, in this, you know, sitting next to each other, but through that interaction, they create a second meaning, a new meaning. And an appreciation for the festivalized intensification and exuberance. I think uh, the aesthetic principle for many Italian Americans is more is better. <laughs> And, and, atten and lastly, an attention to the display and the manipulation of the human figure. And let me just show you sort of, um, so some of you who are here from New York, Diker Heights. Um, and I'm not gonna get into the details. I'll talk a little bit about Christmas lights. I'm not gonna get into the details of how, why Italian Americans are the people in New York City that practice Christmas lights which is something that you find throughout the United States. It's not in New York to, to it's not unique to uh, Italians, and it's not something that was brought over from Italy, like some of the other things that we'll see. But there's, there's something really um, interesting happening in New York City, um, in places like Diker Heights and Canarsie and other places. I won't go into the details, I'll talk a little bit about them, but I won't get into this practice. Diker Heights is another place you really should go out and visit um, this season. So, Italian Catholics are drawn to activities with a strong emphasis upon the concrete and the visible, observed Michael Carroll about historical religious practices in Italy's Mezzogiorno. Thus, a critical aspect in the creation of vernacular sacred sites is Italian Americans' historic involvement with manual labor, and in particular for men, with respect to the building trades. They immigrated as unskilled laborers, and as historian Donna Gabaccia notes, and I quote, on five continents, Italian men were earth movers, masons, and hood car hod carriers, veritable, um, veritable human steam shovels who built the transportation and urban infrastructures of modern capitalism, end of quote. In addition, a number of skilled workers operate in various trades as plasterers, masons, carpenters, sculptors, iron workers, and tile setters. And this is a wonderful, um, uh, as you can see, Italians, uh, Vinny's Italian art, uh, ironworks, and at the top is a shrine to St. Joseph, um, uh, Vincenzo being from Sicily. Isn't that the sacred art? Is it the sacred art? Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. I think you are right. Yes. Yes, thank you. 
I have to get back to my book and look at that. Um, during the 20th century, Italian American in these various occupations went on to establish small and large companies in New York City. Let me just make sure. Um, in New York City, um, supplying materials and services needed for construction, such as cement, contracting, electricity, plumbing, carting, and demolition. Catholic clergy often relied on Italian laborers, masons, and craftsmen in the building of churches and bringing to fruition subsequent ecclesiastic initiatives on church property. That's St. Joseph. In turn, these building skills were fundamental in the creation of a host of religious shrines, chapels, and grottos. Historically, working class Italian Americans associated self-esteem with the fruit of one's labor. In turn, the concept of lavoro ben fatto, or work done well, became a deeply felt and highly integrated, uh, uh, highly regarded sentiment for the well-crafted object in, Itali in Italian American life and artisanal skills, both masculine and feminine, at the service of religious devotion, have been greatly appreciated and valued. The appreciation for the mastering, execution, and discussion of acquired, often historically gendered skills, whether a man constructing a brick wall or woman preparing a meal, is an articulated notion among Italian, New York's Italian Americans. The admiration and pleasure in craft within Italian American cultural contexts are not the exclusive domain of the maker, but are contingent on a discerning and knowledgeable audience. The finished product is not merely an object, but a performance, an enactment of values and aesthetics to be judged by others. Let me just show you one other slide. So in addition to the permanent brick and mortar structures of shrines, chapels, and grottos, assemblage, and here's one more. I guess I was off a slide for building skills. So assemblage is an important aspect of Italian American religious vernacular space. And here you see a ribbon that is, of course, showing not one image of Our Lady of the Snow, but multiple images of one lady of the snow. So as I said, sort of more is, more is better, and um, the multiplicity of religious items and imagery is an important aspect in operation here. This layering and accretion is seen in altars and in the domestic nativity scene, which grow and change over time. The multiplicity of religious imagery and analogies is at the heart of the Catholic imagination and that this intersectionality of ideas, sentiments, images, objects, and related associations. The redundancy of Catholic sacramentality is most evident in Joseph Peza's parking lot attendance shed in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, now defunct, unfortunately, where he worked uh, until a couple of years ago. Neighbors and friends provided Peza with religious prints, Christmas and Easter cards, images from outdated calendars, as well as non-religious items like stuffed animals and a map of Italy that he applied to the shed's interior and exterior walls. As he told me, and I quote, I added to it and people saw it, and then it mushroomed, you know, like a snowball coming down, end of quote. Pez's aesthetic strategy brought together religion, patriotism, ethnic identity, and sports, and a powerful community-sponsored sponsored melange of overlapping associations. And this is the interior of the shed. I don't even know if he actually used it anymore after it became so decorated. Uh, many of the objects were unwanted family heirlooms donated by adult children of recently deceased parents who were uncomfortable jettisoning sacramental objects that no longer exerted the same religious influence it did on their parents. So in this way, Peza became the de facto curator for a museum of Catholicism's past sacramental material culture that American clergy derided with their interpretation and implementation of Vatican II Council prescriptions. And this is something you find in a lot of cases. Um, you'll see um, a grotto out in Staten Island where people would bring their statues from their family uh, members that they didn't have the same associations with but they couldn't bring themselves to just throw it in the garbage. So these guys, so these number of these people became curators in a sense of this past religious uh, imagery. And since this is also the case with Joseph Cadia. Joseph Cadia's hair salon in Diker Heights, Brooklyn, which developed in a similar fashion, developed in a similar fashion. 
in styles ranging from Z Byzantine to Renaissance to contemporary, a multitude of new and vintage statuary and two-dimensional reprints of sacred personages, many of them devoted um, by clients, are artfully arranged. These items are not mere curios or objects of art. Cadio and his hair salon clientele display and use them as sites of sacred presence. This is best evidence in the donated infant, uh, uh, infant Jesus of Prague statue that stands in a scalloped wall niche behind the corner of a room, visible as one enters. The salon shrine is the focus of prayer and devotional acts by Katia's clients, and who he's told me they leave wedding favors, small metal crosses, rosary beads, and even written prayers at the statue. The reclaimed and salvaged objects, accrual of authority and efficacy is enhanced by their repeated and continual use by his clients. A third characteristic of Italian American Catholic vernacular aesthetics is the emphasis on the ceremonial display, manipulation, and animation of human figure, of the human figure, primarily three-dimensional images of sacred personages through narrative or dramatic uh, performance. This valued eye intensive culture of scenes and the theatricalized individual, to quote Pellegrino di Cerno, lends itself to a dense and narrative rich environment in which myth, hygiography, uh, history, and autobiography converge as spoken word and performance enactments. Altars, shrines, presepi, and street processions are packed with a multiplicity of images of the human countenance and form. And this is for um, the procession to uh, St. Fortunata in uh, Bensonhurst. This was taken from a good number of years ago, but they still do the procession um, in these decorated costumes. Sacred narrations and dramatizations highlight the varied voicings and performative aspects of religious display, especially as it concerns vernacular architecture. I could tell you a hundred stories, Gino Vitale assured me, when discussing the miraculous occurrences in his life, calling attention to a narrated landscape. The peripathetic performances of neighborhood processions evoke or actually dramatize sacred narratives of miraculous salvation or manifestations that superimposes mythic historic times and maps associated sites in Italy onto the everyday world of New York. So a number of processions, dramatizations, like the uh, Good Friday processions, but a number of these, the, I think, of course, of the Giglio procession in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which dramatizes this sacred narrative of uh, the bishop, St. Paulinus, returning to Nola after enslavement and uh, being met with the Giglio. So this sort of enactment of a sacred mythic time is, is, comes to life again on Havemeyer and North 8th Street in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And we find this throughout. Um, the city happening. So listening and integrating the spoken word into the study of cultural landscapes, vernacular architecture, and sacred site aids our understanding of the social construction of place and the built environment. I'm very much concerned throughout the book with this notion of place and how there is, there's space out there, but we, we, through the things that we do, create a sense of place. We make it ours. We make it part of a community. And creating space in a very small way or in a very large way in terms of the mapping of these processions on the street are very much part of what, um, what interests me um, with these um, wonderful works of art. So this is um, Giovanni Miniero's um, um, Presepio, which is also displayed outdoors. You can see it's on 14th uh, Avenue in Diker Heights. So the Presepio is a three-dimensional miniature mashup of architecture and landscapes. Ancient Bethlehem, 19th century, bucolic in urban Italy, with a touch of Disney, or what Michael Foucault calls a heterotopia. That is the, and I quote, the juxtaposing in a single real place, several spaces, several sites that are in themselves incompatible, end of quote. And you see in a number of the Presepi um, anachronistic figures. You'll see not only Disney, but you'll see Pizzaiola, you'll see uh, a priest, you'll see St. Francis. Of course, Saint Francis, Francis wasn't there in Bethlehem at the birth of Jesus, but they all become part of this larger fantasy uh, scape that people are building. 
for the Italian. Sausages in the Jewish village. Indeed, <laughs> unless they were made out of goose, right? Exactly. For the Italian American men and women I spoke with, the Perzepio is not a static art object admired solely for its formal aesthetic attributes, but an ephemeral assemblage enlivened by narrative and performance in the service of Christian pedagogy, autobiography, and family history, and the engendering and strengthening of community affiliations. For me as an ethnographer, going into someone's home uh, where there is a presepio is just a treasure because they, people want to tell you what's in the presepio. They want to tell you how it was built. They want to tell you what the figures are, what they mean for you. It's like you don't even have to ask questions because this is a, it's a set piece which allows this, this sort of narration of people's lives um, and, their, and their beliefs. So it's a, it's a wonderful way um, to gather information. And this is John Vito um, from Diker Heights, of course, explaining to me every various aspects of his presepio. He just, in fact, called me this morning to tell me that it's done and I should come over and visit, which I intend to. Interwoven with the narrative of the first Christmas is a highly charged personal one as well. For Presepio builders often explain their displays as condensed and three-dimensional autobiographies, evoking and storing memories of the family, the hometown, the immigrant experience, and even the old neighborhood. John Vito Baralico's Presepio contains pebbles he collected on family vacations. The manger was built with lumber cut from the first Christmas tree he and his wife bought and decorated after getting married and immigrating to Brooklyn. The Presepio is the nexus where mythic, historic, remembered, and imagined temporal and spatial planes converge in the artistically created and emotionally charged representation that is the birth of Christendom's savior. And one of the things, and sort of pulling together this work, I mean, I did this ethnography, but I was also going through the historical documentation. The, there is this, uh, with the Presepio, this burden of elite art in um, uh, scholarly works about the Presepio. So we can understand the history of the Presepio from St. Francis to the Baroque to the, um, to, uh, the 19th century to its mechanicization to its uh, industrialization. But I have yet to find a single work that simply goes into somebody's house and, and asks them and looks at their Presepio. There's, I mean, you could see that with a Dicola Sacre, you could see that with processions, but no one, no one I know that I'm aware of, and I've talked with some people, has done that work. So we don't know, all we know is the figurines that people create. We don't know what people do with the figurines with their presepio, and I think that's a missing aspect. And I think in part, or to a large degree, it's because of this burden of elite art. There's such a rich history with the presepio, really great sculptors making presepio figures. The, the, the statues that are at the Metropolitan um, are a testament to that legacy. But we don't know in Italy how these things actually operate. Um, as you may know, every year, English language press, as, long as, as well as uh, Italian press, uh, talk about the topical political figures that are made in Naples. So you'll see Trump, you'll see, you know, whoever is the, the, the current soccer fan, but you don't know if anybody's actually buying those and putting them in their presepio or not. I think they're really being made for the media and they're made for tourists, but I don't think they're being put in the, 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 the people's presepio. And we don't know that because nobody's done that research. Um, so all of you who are listening out there, please do that research. Um, So some immigrant builders map their own migration histories into the dioramas in way that's, that ways that interpret and help reconcile their past and their present selves. For example, and this is not Pasquale Di Melio's uh, Presepio, another, but uh, no, this is another, um, this is actually the one um, Antonio Vigilante that I said is in the basement of a church you should go see. But Pasquale Di Melio created two distinct areas in his Presepio, representing the United States on the one hand, with a lighthouse, electric trains, and a US flag, and his island home of Ischia and Campania in the middle, with running water, a conch shell, and figures symbolizing his family members. He pointed out, this represents, this is my uncle because he's a fisherman, and this is my, my, my grandfather doing something else. So for elderly immigrants like the late Joseph Funati, a gentleman I met uh, many years ago, the Presepio bears witness, bared witness to different phases of his life. And again, this is not Joseph Funati's Presepio, I'm just using it as an image here. 
So the various phases of his life, the stone grotto that harkens back to the rough finish that he called of Sicilian architecture remembered from his childhood, the figurines purchased in Manhattan's pre-World War II Little Italy, the creche set up in his barbershop window in the 1930s, and the miniatures collected since moving into his private house in Jackson Heights. So the Presepio was a kind of auto, a, a, a three-dimensional autobiography for him. Giving form to autobiography within a religious artwork depicting the birth of God ties one's own sacrifices and achievements to the larger framework of the sacred narrative and in effect elevates one's personal history and life's work to the level of the holy. Variant interpretations and uses of sacred sites contribute to the establishment and maintenance of their spiritual efficacy or their diminishment. So uh, there's not only people who believe in um, these, these sites, but there's those who don't. A disbelieving spouse or a child, a, a disapproving neighbor, a dismissive priest are part of the polyphony of overlapping voices, contributing to the site's symbolic meanings and, ser sites for, and, and search for significance. Examining these realms of competing discourses is articulated, interpreted, and negotiated um, how they do that can reveal how power, both religious and social, are made manifest at these local sites. And this is the Our Lady of Mount Carmel Grotto in Stat Rosebank, Staten Island. It is open seven, seven days a week, 24 hours. You can go anytime you want. It's now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It's really worth going. It was started in the 1930s. Um, it's still seen as an ongoing site for the people there. Um, but it's really um, a wonderful example of Italian-American vernacular religious art in um, New York City. Clerical monitoring of vernacular spaces adds yet another layer of tension. The contested nature of the sacred has historically been felt at the Our Lady of Mount Carmel Grotto in Rosebank, built and maintained by a lay religious voluntary association. Maintaining authority over the grotto's use and interpretation is at the heart of the long-standing tensions between local Roman Catholic clergy and society members. From 1983 to 2009, the local pastor waged a battle of words with the members of the society in an attempt to get control spiritually and financially by publicly vilifying and maligning the members from the pulpit each year during the society-sponsored high mass. So it was a panegyric mass that the clergy, uh, that the uh, society paid for, but from the pulpit, the priest basically berated the members for their um, control of this sacred spice space that wasn't in the control of the church. Um, that situation, this was up until 20, 2009, that situation has ended, but it was a particularly heartfelt um, struggle in the neighborhood for a good period. The priest lambasted people through the assertion of his monophonic authority from his privileged position within the church service. The construction of meaning is not achieved without struggle in Staten Island. A narrative-centered approach to place and architecture, how people actually talk about these places, reveals the ways in which individuals, identities, and ideologies converge and conflict in dynamic relationship to the built environment. And that's why I say this is not the spaces of the late 19th century, the early 20th century of Italian immigrants. These are very vibrant, dynamic places that have meaning in various social, sacred ways um, that are continuous and ongoing. <laughs> Tensions surrounding yard shrines also emerge around aesthetics and tastes, perceptions of Catholic propriety and middle-class decorum. Repudiation of yard shrines appropriateness is not uncommon for Italian Americans striving for middle-class respectability. During my talk on the subject of yard shrines at the public library in neighboring Yonkers, a middle-aged Italian-American man dressed in a suit and tie vehemently rejected the notion that religious figures graced the lawns of his suburban city, declaring them a New York City out-of-borough phenomenon. Although, the reason I had gone to the library was because I was there to document all the numerous yard shrines that existed in Yonkers at the invitation of somebody who had built one, a beautiful stone grotto, and had sent me a picture for him. So for this man and others, the stigma of gauche, working class, ethnic Catholic culture is an ever-present threat, and being tarred with the brush of the lower class gavone, or a boar, 
is a palpable fear within the parameters of taste regimes on group identity. The spaces efficacy, um, these spaces efficacy lies in part in their ability to instill a sense of intimacy with one's immediate surroundings by, by providing opportunities to reconfirm involvement in, commitment to, and identification with the local urban area. This is a photograph um, from uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Um, from the 1980s, the late 1980s. The next picture we're going to see is the same block across the street from just a couple of year, years ago. Such face-to-face -face social interaction and the reproduction of a network of acquaintances occurs through the repeated blurring of the boundaries between private and public, the domestic and the street. This is a, um, an altar, a, a mass that is actually said on the street each year for Saint Donato, San Donato. Yard shrines and sidewalk altars extend not only the private devotions into the public sphere, but as votive acts also provide powerful testimony to the supernatural presence in people's lives. Celebration of the religious calendar contributes to the festive porosity of the home, temporary altering dwellings into open houses. So not only are the saints and people uh, coming out into the streets, but the doors are opened up so that people can come inside. The creation of festive altars in living rooms and finished basements, open rented apartments and private homes to the non-familial guests who pray and socialize in communion with the individual or family sponsor. And often this is done without the oversight of the local clergy. And I'm, I apologize for the black and white um, um, rendition of this uh, image. A viewing of the sprawling domestic presepio by scores of visiting family members, neighbors, and friends, as well as journalists and the inquisitive scholar, provides devotional reference points linking individuals to a larger collective. And uh, um, people told me um, often that once they built the presepio, that was the time when they would visit their the family would come and visit for cookies and coffee um, before the big Christmas um, celebration. So this is exactly what happened. This, these two couples, this couple here, had finished their presepio and um, their neighbor and uh, relatives, Paisani actually, and relatives of mine went over to visit. And um, when they returned, when they moved back to, this was their Italian presepio, when they moved back to Formia in Lazio, they told me that they built their, continued to build what they called their American presepio. <laughs> I don't think anything was different, just that the location was. So a place-centric approach to the religious beliefs and practices of a diasporic people such as Italians must take into consideration the dynamic exchange between a distant homeland and New York City. These Italian diasporic identities, given the close ties with Italian paesi or townships, augments, or were augmented with the arrival of a new wave of working class Italian immigrants after World War II. And this is really important to keep in mind as we presented in our book, um, um, a couple of weeks ago here, um, a lot of these things are practiced by Italian immigrants who arrived after World War II, in addition to Italian Americans who were born here. But that sort of reinvigoration of Catholic practices by that new wave of, of uh, immigrants was, is really crucial. And this is um, from Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and um, it was really important there. Between 1945 and 1973, it is estimated that um, 129,000 uh, to 150,000 Italian immigrants settled in New York City. The influx of new Italian immigrants helped stabilize and reestablish the Italian American presence of various neighborhoods in, in New York. In particular, Post-war immigrants were central in revitalizing community institutions such as local parishes and lay religious voluntary associations whose memberships were dwindling, as in the case of the Society of St. Mary of the Snow and the San Cono di Tejano Catholic Association in Williamsburg. And this is a, um, outside of the San Cono um, Society, this is a memorial to several members of the Tejanese community who died in 9-11, and it was created in part with the, um, the, the bishop and the mayor of Tejano coming over and helping to create this, um, this shrine. So there is this kind of continued linkage between uh, New York City and the various um, sites in Italy. This immigrant replenishment to, um, to um, 
keep in mind a, a notion, a sociological notion. And the use of ethnically linked religious symbols and practices were keys to reaffirming the Italian American identity in a city as a lived experience. This is not sort of um, sort of nostalgic, um, a nostalgic uh, rekindling of old immigrant uh, culture. This is lived in a lived experience that was very much part of New York. Devotees, clergy, festa artisans, religious, religious literature and sacramentals, mediated communications, and monetary donations, among others, circulate across borders, and not just between Italy and New York, but in the 21st century, also between Italy, New York, Canada, Australia, Argentina, and Brazil, and other diasporic points, as part of an Paese-affiliated ethnoscape of global piety. This transnational religious exchange takes very specific forms. So not only did the Canadian Tejanais venture to Brooklyn when the St. Cono statue was brought over from Italy to uh, New York, but Williamsburg devotees have reciprocated by participating in their Montreal procession, as well as by visiting their co-nationalists in Venezuela during their celebrations. Antonio Curcio of Williamsburg has led a, Brook a, a, a group of Brooklyn Sanzesi who raised funds for and traveled to not only the Italian feast, but also its counterparts sponsored by Paisani in Melbourne, Australia, San Paolo, Brazil, and Mendoza, Argentina. So partaking in these various processions and celebration, Cucho feels a diasporic sense of community. This, they are like family, he told me. So change is a defining feature of urban life with its cycles of capital investment and disinvestment construction and demolition shifting demographics of global populations and resulting surf, uh, turf successions that has significant impact on the religious life and is interpreted through a religious lens this was a really wonderful little church saint rosalia and bensonhurst and as you can see the shifting um, demographics in that neighborhood, um, Italian, Spanish, English, and Chinese. Unfortunately, just this year, that chapel was destroyed, that small church was destroyed because the, um, the Catholic Church deemed that it was unnecessary and didn't have enough parishioners and sold the property and destroyed it just, I think, like two months ago. That's what happens, and that's what impacts um, the various communities. The American Community Survey of 2010 census listed New Yorkers of Italian descent at 590,000, down from 839,000 in 1990 and 1 million in 1980. Today, Carroll Gardens, Williamsburg, and other neighborhoods that experience increased Italian American populations due to post World War II Italian immigration um, are witnessing dwindling Italian American demographics. Bensonhurst, an area that has been touted as the city's new Little Italy back in the day because of the influx of Italian immigrants during the 1960s and 70s, is going through a steady decline of its Italian Americans. And yet, and yet, Italian Americans, uh, Italian -Americans const continue to constitute a significant, albeit diminishing, demographic in New York City, contributing in countless ways to various aspects of religious, cultural, political, and economic spheres. This is Williamsburg, if you couldn't tell from the photo. <laughs> Gentrification raises a different but related set of questions concerning religious space. Cecilia Cacais of Carroll Gardens, who in fact, um, several years ago, a longtime resident of, of Carroll Gardens, was evicted from her home um, in her 90s and had to go move with her daughter to Wisconsin, of all places, um, because of the increased gentrification. Note, Cecilia Cacais noted the articulated perceptions of prevalent religious practices by newcomers, this is her word, to her once working class Carroll Gardens, where homes now sell for well over a million dollars. Quote, they moved to this neighborhood for what they considered the ambiance, the flavor of the Italian American, and then they sit there and they mock. They would even mock the shrines. They consider the shrines to be paganistic, end of quote. 
Given the change, memory has profound importance for constructing religious scripted narratives of home and the connected uh, vernacular religious spaces and the register of these reminiscences is a deeply nostalgic one. People um, in Williamsburg uh, talk about the ways in which they're, they feel they're being perceived as um, almost like primitive, uh, the pr primitive tribal people with anthropologists coming in uh, because of the, the case of smartphones, people taking photographs all the time. There's, there's less and less interaction between people on the sidewalks and the pr people who are walking in the procession and more and more of just this sort of gawking and um, taking of, uh, of, of uh, photographs, what I call, uh, call the, the gentrifying gaze of uh, religious space. So you'll be, re you'll be happy to hear this in my next quote. Um, this is a, of course, a Gai Yin, a Chinese deity on top of what, uh, a grotto that used to be um, house, uh, the statue of St. Anthony of Padua. So for Rafaela Piatanza of Bensonhurst, yard shrines represent, we have Rafaela's daughter here in the audience. Yard Shrines represents a sense of stability and comfort as a new influx of immigrants of various religious and racial backgrounds, including Mexican Catholics, Russian Jews, Chinese Buddhists, and Pakistani Muslims has transformed her once predominantly Italian neighborhood over the past 20 years. And I quote, before there were more of us who were, ca there were, more, of us who were Catholics, more Italians. Instead, now there's so many races, one does, and this was all done in uh, Italian and this was translated. Now there are so many races. One doesn't see any more that welcoming acceptance. Seeing these statues in the yards, and not this one in particular, but other ones with Saint Donato and Saint Padre Pio, um, I feel as if the saints are watching us, that they protect us. The saints protect us. And so I asked her, they protect you from, from what? And she said, from the many things that can happen because the change of the area is a little distressing. So these yard shrines, their constant presence, um, also offers comfort in this um, moment of change and crisis. The construction, use, and interpretation of the various sacred spaces discussed today are creative, dynamic acts, a reworking of religious idioms to meet current needs. Gino Vitale's updated Dicole Sacre are hybrids bridging the Sicilian agro town and one of the trendiest neighborhoods on the planet. Nostalgia itself, though, can be an active force in creating sacred space and community. The loss of and lament for an immigrant-based, geographically situated community of pre-Vatican II Catholics underscores the religious artistry of two Brooklyn men. Chris DeVito and James Quintoni, devotees of Our Lady of Mount Carmel and St. Anthony of Padua, respectively. And this is Chris DeVito's altar. And this is, um, uh, this is James Quintoni actually photographing his own altar. Their annual festival altars erected in their homes are focal points for reconstituting the world of pre-consular Catholicism through its inclusion of such evocative elements as wax candles, the vivid colors and smells of cut flowers, the drapery of dress saint statues and the embroidered altar cloths, as well as the recorded music of church organ and Gregorian chants. These creative expressions provide opportunities for fostering a dynamic community of like-minded Catholics familiar and comfortable with an array of religious and aesthetic principles grounded in an ethnic past remembered from childhood. And I'm sorry for the sort of out of focus photograph, but this house was just sort of filled with people. It was a little bit difficult to get a, a good shot. Quintoni acknowledges that his altar is in keeping with past devotional practices and that the intimate setting of the home provides an immediate venue for many visitors in which to engage the sacred. He recounts stories about he recounts stories about visitors who are attracted to and stimulated by the altar and its past sacramental associations. They find solace and their prayers answered by turning to St. Anthony in Quintoni's house. In these narratives, there are people who, and I quote, don't know how to pray, but coming in here, that kind of old fashioned shrine, and not maybe the big church, did something for them, and they were able to find the words to ask St. Anthony what they needed, end of quote. In turn, those devotees tell family and friends about Quintoni's domestic altar, and often bring them to Quintoni's home. 
comfortable to gather there and to recite the prayer, the rosary and say novena prayers in a community of like-minded believers. In the sanctuary of the sanctified living room, people create a sense of belonging through their personal stories of illness and healing, of supplication and deliverance. These religious environments also engender new aggregations, both acts by both by accident and design, affiliations more fluid and open than those remembered, and at times even those in imagined. And I say you should read that chapter to get a little bit of clues about what those new affiliations are. I won't go into it here. The folk aesthetics, and in conclusion, the folk aesthetics are the underpinnings for a rich array of visual arts architecture and material culture that are integral to understanding how art is conceptualized, implemented, and esteemed in New York City beyond the walls of renowned museums and fashionable galleries. The varied interpretations of these creative acts, dismissed as kitsch or prized as folk art, contribute to the understanding of how value and meaning are reproduced at the confluence, confluences of everyday life. Thank you. We are doing this for the recording, especially. Yep. Uh, I know you could perfectly hear me. Um, and, it, and it is true, or maybe to a misinterpretation of, of Vatican II, because popular piety was one of the uh, bases. They wanted to go back to the, to the piety of the people and understanding, but it, there was a sort of iconoclastic uh, fury that followed Vatican II. Um, on one hand, getting rid of a lot of Orpelli and decorations that uh, had very little to do with Christianity, but on the other hand, also getting rid of traditions that were built in the in the memory and in the life of people, especially of the lower classes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge defeat of the spirit of Vatican II. The fact that, in the name of Vatican II, there is a council that uh, aspired to bring the church closer to the to the poor. Uh, it ended up being perceived as a moment that somehow did a cleanup mm -hmm. of, the, of popular piety mm -hmm. uh, from the church. And going with this observation, also the fact that uh, you correctly pointed out to the fact that very often uh, these uh, works of art, of these, of these constructions, would be uh, looked down by clergy. And uh, therefore, there is this dialectic uh, relationship between the owners and the builders of, the, of these artifacts and, and local clergy. Sometimes it's a more positive, sometimes as in the example you, you brought up, it was a very strongly um, and constant accusation and, and uh, attack on them. And I was wondering whether that on one hand is disappointing because the priest should be able to understand what's behind uh, the work that these people do. But on the other hand, it also preserved them as they are. The fact that they were not simply incorporated and become one like side altar of a church probably being forgotten. But the fact that people had to fight to preserve them, the fact that people had constantly to find reasons to, uh, to justify the fact that they existed and they wanted to continue to exist for the future, gave them a sense of identity because they had to explain to themselves first and then to others why they were doing that. And they kept the, their independence. They are still the owners of owners and it's not only a question of property, but it's a question of uh, owning it spiritually, their product. Right. And I see that, for example, in, um, in another part of the world, but in, in Andalusia, in, in the south of Spain, uh, the, the beautiful celebrations and processions that you have for Holy Week that are impressive and the entire world goes and admires, they are also done sort of in parallel with the uh, sacraments and the masses celebrated by the church. But the owners of the sacred images that are at the center of these possessions are lay brotherhoods and now sisterhoods. Right. Uh, they decide whether the procession is going to start or not, whether the statue is going to be brought out or not. They don't consult with the priests. It's a brotherhood. They gather together. And then El Hermano Mayor 
will make the announcement. It's not something that is done in consultation. And they always kept this dialectic between the laity and, and the priests. And I think that's also what preserved them. For example, they were not uh, swiped away by Vatican II. Right. They kept the right. traditional processions with tons of incense and uh, dozens and dozens of huge candles and, and all the rest because they belong and they were property, they were owned in the sense that I just mentioned by lay uh, associations. They were not property of the parish or the diocese and they did not uh, fall under the direct control of bishops. Right. It's, you know, and I don't want to create the impression that all priests are against these vernacular things, these types of art. Um, and as I said, it's not only the clergy, it's family members. I mean, I often went and interviewed people and not only did they say, I don't believe in the miracle that my mother says happened, the reason why I'm still here, because she prayed to the Virgin Mary and I was cured. Um, but I don't, also don't like these these things in the front yard. Catholic art shouldn't be out displayed in the front yard, or um, this is too gaudy or too kitsch. So there's those aspects. I think the real dynamic happens in these big, larger feste, right? Because for them to happen, you need the parishioners. It's not just a single person that is going to have a 100,000 person feast happen. The success of that is going to be with the people who are um, part of that community, part of that church, who are the devotees, who are the believers, who are just the townspeople in the case of you know, Europe or in the case of New York um, neighborhoods. And you see this tension going on a lot. I, I, I think in particular of the Williamsburg uh, Giulio feast in which um, you know, the people who, it's, it's a, now it is a church sponsored um, activity in the 1950s it was taken over from a society and the, by the church um, but the people who do it are the, the are the, the people of the, the community um, the tensions are there and things are always having to be negotiated all kinds of things everything from where you put the beer stand you know not too close to the church steps um, or the gambling that goes on to different aspects of the ceremony itself and that stuff is always being negotiated and I think you know, as you said, there may be dissenting voices coming from various parts, but how they are interacted with, how they are responded to, how they are negotiated is part of what gives these things their dynamism. You know, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're not static objects. They, 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 they create um, strong feelings in people. People have um, very important, passionate notions about how it should be displayed, how, you know, what kind of level of respect, what are, what are the proper rituals that go with this particular object or this particular performance. And those strong feelings are what animates those objects, I think, and, I, and or those, those dramatizations in the case of larger festa, yeah. And I, I think, and sort of getting an understanding of that and handle, getting a handle on that, um, I think one can get a better sense of what these are, not just see them as, oh, there's a ver concrete Virgin Mary in a front yard, and I think I know everything about them, and that's it. I don't need to ask any more questions. Kind of. Yeah. Hi. Um, it seems to me, uh, when I came here in 1972, and I landed actually in Queens, where there was less of this kind of uh, niche, you know, the Nikkei that you see in Brooklyn, especially in Carroll Gardens. It was very foreign to me as an Italian, a young man who was a chiricetto, uh, to arrive in New York and actually start seeing these Nikkei that were on private property. The same immigrants that are doing this here and that have created this in this city do not have that or did not have that in their own hometowns where they came from. Because the hometowns, the place where you worship, is the church. There were the Nikkei, the Santuari, uh, you have the San Cono, in Tejano you have the large needle with San Cono on top. You have you know, 20 churches just in the city because there's also a base over there. So. But this seems to me almost kind of a, because this phenomenon is largely the product 
an expression of poor, largely illiterate, like my parents, it, so, southern Italian farmers who came to this really wild place and kind of settled near each other to, to be safe, it's a manifestation of the memory of what they had more than a, a, a tradition which they brought with them. Because I don't remember, maybe in other towns and in other regions of southern Italy it was different. Maybe in Bari it was different. But I don't remember anyone having those intricate altars in their homes and inviting their vicini, you know, in small towns to come and see them. That, that is almost looked down upon. Actually, it's looked down upon there because the, the, the religious place to actually worship is in the church or in the cappella because you know there's a church and there's a lot of capellas in all these towns and so everybody has their favorite saint but when you go and you you worship or you have a miracle that you believe happened you go and you bring your gift or your uh, your offering to the saint in the church so this is this is a very uh, new york new york centric phenomenon and it's almost kind of um of, of uh, I'm trying to find the right word, so I apologize. But it's like when we talk about because you were talking about high art, and and not high art. And when Stefano introduced you, you know, he said a few words about that too. The difference between the things. Um, most of these folks don't know the difference um, between uh, don't know the difference between the art and the image within the art. So when they look at a Michelangelo, when my father looked at a Michelangelo or a Madonna, he didn't look at Raphael, he looked at the Madonna. So there's a, you know, art is really not in their head at all, or the artistic tradition. You know, they don't know about Piero della Francesca or all this whole thing. It's more about the holding on of the safety and then it manifests through their craft, you know, so the, the Mason does it in masonry like Gino. Gino has been one of the promoters of the gentrification of Carol Gardens, I know him personally. <laughs> so <laughs> he's benefited from it, you know, and he continues to do that. So a lot of, a lot of this gentrification that, you know, even in, in Greenpoint, that you see that seems to see it as a paganistic way, um, expression, I see it also as a paganistic expression. I'm wondering about that, because I'm, I'm from there. I was, you know, I'm an insider. <laughs> And now, you know, in Carroll Gardens, I'm considered a leftover because I've been there for more than 25 years. <laughs> and that's the word they use, by the way, you know, that a lot of the newcomers that come in, I'm a newcomer to there too. But, so I'm just wondering about that, you know, the, the religious, the artistic aspect, how you have sure. thought about that. Sure. Um, there's a long history of, oh, we're talking about the yard shrines in particular, there's a long, his, centuries old history of Edicola Sacra in Italy. Not talking about the church, not talking about the chapels, but these roadside structures or the ones that are attached to the walls. I mean, they're all over. Um, and uh, people do go there and leave offerings and say prayers there. It's those smaller um, uh, sites that I'm, that are the direct uh, descendant of these um, are the of these yard shrines in New York City. So there is a direct link. It's not I I don't see it at all as a sort of a memory or a projection of something that didn't exist in Italy. There's I mean there's documentation of that and and people make direct references to this was like the one that was on the wall that in the street outside my house etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that 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 these are a con there is a continuity there. Um, I'm not sure if what else. What I meant yeah. To say, what yeah. I meant to say is, you don't walk. I don't. I can't recall walking down a street. I can't recall walking down a street in all the towns I had visited or still visit now, where you see 35 Madonnas. You know, like in Carroll Gardens, really. I mean, you know, right. 10, 15 years ago, right. up to 10 years ago, you could walk down second place or right. third place. Right. Every single house right. had one. Right. Every single one. That just doesn't happen. Anymore. Well, the, the difference is that there is private property, and it's so that, and you have the structure of, you know, block houses. I mean, you have house after house after house. And the other thing, what happens is, and I think this is not particular to um, to religious statues, but to the ways in which neighborhoods and blocks work. It's like if you get an aluminum awning, 
Everybody on your block now has an illumining awning. You know, you have illumining fencing that the Chinese, uh, um, Chinese Americans have promoted through various ways. It's like everybody on the block now has it, right? So it's not simply about, it's not merely about the religious and the sacred. It's all it's about local aesthetics. And, and, and I don't see it as competition, but just becomes, that becomes the norm. The ways, in, and, and that's not particular to Bensonhurst or Brooklyn, that happens in a number of places in Manhattan as well. What becomes the, the, the you know, you put up white lights for Christmas because on the Upper West Side, you don't wanna have gaudy multicolored lights. You have to have white lights. So it just becomes about community aesthetics in that case. And so I think that that's one of the contributing factors and the factor that it's private property and you are allowed to do what you want on that, on that site. So I think that there's a difference. I'm still not, I feel like I'm still not getting to the, the second aspect of your, of your, well, your we'll comment. Hopefully, hopefully. Um, I, want, I, want, uh, do, yeah. I wanted to say the, uh, I wanted to talk about the, what you were saying about the, um, the spaces versus uh, places, right? Mm -hmm. So the image that I had was about when a cat sees a piece of paper and it immediately goes on the piece of paper. And that's how we are as human beings, you know, like we immediately take possession of some space, you know, whether it's a chair or even on the subway, we do it all the time, you know, we, we take we take space. Um, but the um, the idea of making altars, which a presepe is an altar, by the way, this is exactly what it is. It's an altar to ourselves, you know, and, and to create a connection with the sacredness of the memory of the nativity. And then within that, uh, it's the old narration that you were talking about. Like, you know, like it was very moving and touching when you said, you know, the autobiography of the man, I don't remember which one there, but even when he said, this is my uncle who's a fisherman and so forth, right? So it starts from the narration from the beginning when Jesus was born, and then everybody wants to be a part of that story. So to put the salami or, or to put the, um, you know, things that are anachronistic is, is an attempt to be part of that story of the birth of Christ, which is our, you know, imaginary model of, of you know, coming from, for those of us who are, um, for those, you know, whoever is Christian. And therefore, a presepe is the most uh, intimate connection that we have with that, because now this is our time in which we can say, I was there too. And, and not every time we can say that. Yes. And that's the profound part of, of, you know, of the presepe, which is why it's so touching, right? And so, and, and I'll say just one of the things that does happen, and I know this only, especially because I build my own presepio, and I think that's one of the things is when you actually do something and you practice it, you, I, I've learned more building a presepio, or I've learned a lot building my own presepio and having it in my home um, about what it means for other people. Because one of the things you do mentally is you kind of like imagine yourself walking through the presepio. You miniaturize yourself into this, this landscape and you travel through it. Um, and you then, of course, also travel through time, um, given that there's this temporal dimen there is dimension. There's the temporal to dimension, it. right? Yeah. And so, for example, um, in in that with that said, then of course uh, um, it becomes even more um, uh, painful and and no, not painful. Um, the 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 absence from like the the distance from home becomes painful, and therefore here making the presepe becomes. Um, even more uh, significant, you know, significant, and therefore that's why also and immediately you perceive that 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 meaning that he has, because then when the people go back home, they say, "I make my American presepe," because it always means a continuity. You are actually making a town, so you are reproducing, you know, the place in which you are, which is of course an internal place because you already have the place where right now we're here, then we go out, we have the city. But this one now is the place that you can make. It's a storytelling, mm -hmm. really, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's like writing or, or creating, or like in this case, you know, building an altar. So mm -hmm. it's building an altar. But it's also making an altar that is not necessarily only sacred, though it becomes sacred. And the sacredness of an altar, and the reason why it becomes problematic for the church in a certain sense is because the connection that we create with the sacred when we make our own altar, it makes us powerful. It makes us incredibly centric. Like right there, it's we and God, right? And therefore, like for example, that beautiful thing with the woman on the stairs, on the on the stoop, and she had all of those beautiful, you know, the, the linens there. 
she was proud. This is what I did, right? And she is speaking to the saint. Uh, th that's the offering. It's a sacrifice, right? It's a sacrifice of linen. It's a sacrifice of flour. She put time. She put money. She did it beautifully, right? And now it's her and the divinity, but it's also her and the divinity and the community around it. So that creates an intimate connection, which is where all the proce processioni and everything that we do in town. So when we that makes a person connected to the church, but it also separates it from the church. And the divide is very, very, very um, ineff ineffable, right? And the church is aware of that. I mean, the church at large, I'm, I'm just saying. So these forms uh, are actually pagan because altars are pagan. And the connection, but, but and just one thing, I just to say. I would disagree with the word no, pagan. But, I find, go no, ahead. But, but, but what I mean by say pagan, it just means pre-Christian. And I shouldn't have said pre okay. pagan, maybe just pre-Christian. Okay. And, and I'll conclude by saying sure. this, just so that you understand where I'm sure, coming sure. from. Dionysus, who was supposed to be, uh, of course, worshipped outside of the city, um, the only, the, the the way in which you would, which goes right back to what you said about space and place, you could you, um, make an altar to him by simply making four posts, okay, four posts um, of, of wood, and within those four, and within that space, that was sacred to him. And you would put four pine cones on these four poles, and within that space, you would be able to to, to pay homage to the divinity. Right. So you're just creating a space. Right. And, and, and I think that, you know, we can't talk about, I think it's, I think it's incorrect to talk about the sacred and the abstract. I mean, the sacred is about the humans who, in, who, who embody the sacred, who create, who make the sacred material, who make it visible. Um, it's, it's only through our interpretations of various phenomenon that is made into our understanding of the sacred. I mean, it's only through the written word, the, the enactments, the, the constructions that we understand the sacred. The sacred is not this abstract thing, I don't think. And I think it is only through the individuals who interact in a social way that the sacred is made manifest. Otherwise, it's, there's, I mean, unless we're, unless we're talking, um, how we're talking is what makes the sacred um, visible. Yeah, I have a, I, I, we may have had this discussion before. I, I find, I'm, I'm very leery of the word pagan because it's easy to, I think it's used to dismiss. I think, if I may, I, I think it's used to dismiss Catholic practices that even though they may have some connection to pre-Christian um, um, uh, pantheons and uh, practices, the things that are happening here are very much based in Catholic life. They're not pagan in any way. Um, while there may be some antecedents, I mean, people even say that the, uh, the Dicola Sacra don't go back to pre-Christian times, that you really only see them emerging in the Renaissance. There's this big debate, even though um, there's a big debate and they go back and forth. Um, the ways in which people are practicing them, they're not practicing them in the way in which I understand paganism to be to be constituted and so that i i think there that the use of the term pagan becomes very quickly and I, uh, political and i don't mean this in the left or right or or democrat um republican it's a political connotation it's an ascription to a set of practices that um i think like the word kitsch um says more about the person speaking than the actual object Sure, okay, sure. Like, like my, of course, my, uh, my, uh, oh, sorry, yes, okay, sorry. My, um, my connection, well, I mean, my uh, perception of paganism is absolutely noble. I'm a priestess of a, of a pagan religion, so I would never even right, uh, which think which is a different thing. Yes. But paganism but, as a religion right, is a thing. But this is, right. this is how I intend the word. Right. I meant to say oh, okay. Christian in, in the sense of, to me, pagan is absolutely uh, a marvelous uh, word. That there is nothing, yeah, yeah. just because it's, what it means is that it's pre-Christian, or that in this case, modern means that it doesn't have, uh, it's not one of the three um, monotheistic religions mm -hmm. being Islam, Christianity, or Judaism, but that is like maybe in polytheistic uh, beliefs. But 
uh, Christianity is very much embedded in uh, pre-Christian, uh, ancient Greek, uh, um, and also Roman, um, and even Etruscan, uh, you know, cults. And therefore, um, some of the things that we do, for example, you were saying San Cono, but in t you, you named Tejano, which is where we come from, you know, Sala Consilina, Sansa. Um, many of the traditions that we have, the, the Catholic traditions, are embedded in pre-Christian rituals that can be immediately verified. So that's what I meant. I didn't right. mean pagan in, right, a, right. in any... Okay. Right, okay. Because, I mean, you hear it constantly. I mean, it just... Um, yeah, I mean, or even, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, I think there's, there's, there's a number, especially within the Italian American community, and we've talked about this, and, and some of you know, I mean, this reclamation of the Black Madonna, this notion of that the Black Madonna, um, a Madonna with Caucasian features, but um, with a dark skin, is in some way tied to some, like there's a, an interpretation of wanting to tie it to paganism. Paganism as a positive aspect that is a way to create a multicultural discourse um, in relationship to other communities out there. I'm not saying it's not a, it's a bad thing to happen, but I'm saying that it's mindful to be, it's, it's necessary to be mindful about the political uses of the word paganism and how they're being, what's being labeled pagan for which, you know, whether it's the old school Irish nuns or for the, the black Madonna devotee who wants to see um, and wants to ascribe a certain set of um, historical interpretations and beliefs upon this, this figure um, to suit a, a kind of 21st century multicultural agenda. I mean, all of that. So, I mean, it's, it's a loaded term, and I, I, so I, I often react to it in that way. Yeah. I want to say one other thing. I guess the second part of your question, now that I'm thinking about it. I mean, these, you know, the St. Joseph's altar is that type of altar, um, and just one of a number of examples in Italy in which people do do a festive altar and open it up to um, the community at large. And that the documentation of other types of festa altars, altars that are not there all year round, but then get erected or get assembled simply for the, the, um, for the holiday is very, very much part of Southern Italian, um, you know, religiosity, vernacular religiosity. And so th that part is, I mean, there is a, it's not, it's not merely a, New York phenomenon. It's a direct relationship. I, I, I go to this um, wonderful St. Joseph celebration in a social club in Astoria, and they have Skype on where they're communicating with the people who have their St. Joseph's altar up in their homes. And there's this kind of constant dialogue going on, this kind of transnational uh, digital um, divide is being, is being overcome through the vis-a-vis -vis the St. Joseph's altar. But we can continue. You could you respond, or we can continue the conversation. No. Yeah. Yeah. This is. On. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I. This. This. These types of processions, presepi, uh, la Madonna in, el, in, el, in una grotta, they are really Italian and Italian American. I don't think any other. Um, group of Catholics in the United States does what we do in New York and in, in, in Brooklyn and in, in, in all of these ethnic neighborhoods. And especially Williamsburg, which has two major feasts. Of course, San Cono is like a really big deal among all the Tachinese. And there are many of them who live there. And of course, our own Giglio, because my family, as you know, was from Nola. The building of the Giglio, the preparation that starts the minute it's, it's, it comes down. And also, something that's happening, which I think is extremely good, is that the new pastors of Our Lady Mount Carmel are making a tremendous effort to keep it going, and not only to keep it going among the the older Italians, but the new people who come. And you should know that more than anything. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What goes on uh, in the uh, pre preparation of the Giglio in, um, 
in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, the relationship between the lay uh, organization that builds it and the relationship with the parish. I'll let you know. Sure. First, I would say that while um, Italian Americans in places like Brooklyn have created um, these sacred spaces, it's really not unique to Italian Americans. I mean, this really is a kind of Catholic phenomenon all over the world. Catholics in the Philippines and in Colombia and in throughout Latin America create nativity scenes. Uh, I mean in, in the United States, in Los Angeles, Chicago, um, in Miami, they create yard shrines, they or house shrines, they create yard shri yard shrines, house altars, they do processions, they do nacimientos. I mean, this is a Catholic thing. I mean, the French Canadians in New England create um, yard shrines. I, I, I had a wonderful time driving back from Quebec City, and both on both sides of the border, you can see these these really elaborate, wonderful yard shrines uh, put by uh, French Canadians. So it's not, I, you know, I think there's a certain aesthetic um, um, uh, thing going on with Italian Americans in New York City, and I, I'm not looking at Italian Americans in Chicago or Boston or, else, or New Orleans or elsewhere. But it's this is a pan. Everything I look here is pan Catholic and happening in throughout the United States. So that's an, an important thing to keep in mind. Um, regarding the, the the Giglio feast, I mean, I can't get into the mechanics of it, um, the in individual aspects. But like um, Stefano was saying, the Giglio feast is something that um, is while the, the Catholic priest is the person who is running the church, um, and, but it's the, it's the community who is running the feast. But there, are a number of, there have been a number of discrepancies over the course of the years that I've been looking at it. Um, you know, one from how do you talk to the media about why you're lifting the Giglio? So when I first got there in the early 1980s, all the young men would say, it's a macho thing, I'm doing it for my girlfriend. And the priest came down and made a concerted effort to squash that kind of response. And so that over the course of years, you began to see the lifters, as they're called, the people who lift the Giglio, 125 guys who put it on their shoulders, began to talk about either more likely to talk about, I do it because my father did it, my grandfather did it, or began to talk about it in this kind of devotional way. And that sacred aspect, especially for the Giglio, was not a part of the feast historically. People in NOLA, they get paid to, to lift the Giglio. They don't do it for sacred reasons. Um, and so it got, it, it got like inscribed by the, the church, the priest at the time. So those, as I said, those dynamics are being worked out on all kinds of different ways. What are the figures on the, what figures can be on the, on the statue? Who gets to ride on the statue? What kind of music is played? Um, what music is played at the moment that it stops in front of the church steps? All those things are like, they're negotiated settlements that take, you know, that happen over the course of years and decades. You know, and there's all this history and baggage because people have long memories in the Giglio feast. And you know, they remember things that happened in the 1950s um, that still have, they still resonate for people because of what somebody said or did and what they conceded to on um, one of these negotiated settlements. Not unique to the Giglio face. I think it's very much part of, I mean, just part of social life and very much part of um, Catholic social life, I think, because there is this figure um, and, and this hierarchy within the church of um, what gets to, who gets to speak for and who gets to interpret what's happening and what's being displayed. And I think this is this part of what, uh, what you were talking about, about the pagan, um, in which um, these, these individuals are the ones that are communicating, directing, are directing their and other people's devotions to the, to the saints, the Virgin Mary, and to God. And often, they're, sometimes they're having church they're having mass in there with kind of rogue priests. I mean, there's always these kind of, and I don't mean rogue in a, that they're sort of outside of the, outside of the, the Catholic Church, but they're not, they're not, they're always, they often, they're not affiliated with the local church in which the person comes. So they're getting somebody from another diocese who's coming in because the local priest doesn't necessarily want to be involved in that. So they've got to bring somebody else in. And so, um, there is, they're, they're calling the shots, you know, they're calling shots. I've, I've been to a number of St. Joseph's altars here where the priest comes in, blesses the altar, 
And that's it. You're done. Move. We, like now we have to do all the, the prayers. We have to do the, the shouting to St. Joseph. We have to serve the food in a certain way. Um, there's this, the, the, the family members who represent the saints have to act in a certain way. The priest is not involved in that. He doesn't organize that. He doesn't script it. He doesn't curate it in any single way. And so that's, you know, things, what's going on, you know, in every place, every single part of this. And I think this is very much as to your aspect is these people are, um, they, they have agency. And that is, that is a cause for tension within a system like the Catholic Church. Thanks. Thank you. I wonder if you could comment on it, um, and this goes, I think, over and above the difference in language, where at the turn of the century there was widespread, we can't even imagine now, the widespread prejudice against Italians. Yes. We arrived Italians yes. to this country. It, was, it yes. was in the media, it was, it was on cover stories of magazines, sure. and it was incredible. But you have this uh, situation where there were certain parishes that to accommodate the newly arrived immigrants from Italy, they would have upstairs church for the Irish, predominantly Irish population, Irish Americans, and then the lower church for Italian Americans, new immigrants. And it, it went over and above, as I was saying, over and above the difference in language, because it was very obviously a difference in terms of how they looked at religion. It was more, perhaps you could say, austere mm -hmm. for, for the, Again, I don't want to generalize, but for the Irish Americans predominantly, I'd say. Whereas for the Italians, with their uh, asking for the intercession of the saints, the, the, um, the, and, and the Blessed Mother, St. Joseph, and the, uh, Jesus, um, that it was their way of kind of getting a more immediate sort of, again, intercession, mediation, by having statues of the saints that they could then visualize. It wasn't, it wasn't worship, it wasn't idolatry, but just as a way of presenting a visual image to them, of something relevant, something human, one, one who had been human previously, um, that they could easily relate to. So I wonder if you could comment on that. It kind of, I guess, goes sort of what you Sure, um, there's about. a lot there. Um, I've, over the years, especially in working through this book, have come to have a better understanding of the Irish um, in, rela in relationship to the Catholic Church. Um, you have to keep in mind, by the time the Italians get there in the 1880s, the, ca the Ita Irish Catholic have had to negotiate being Catholics in a Protestant United States. And they suffered through all kinds of anti-Catholic sentiment and as well as anti-Irish sentiment, anti-immigrant sentiment. So they created this thing called a kind of American Catholicism. It exists, there were Catholics here before the Irish arrived in the 1840s, but they really, especially on the East Coast, um, as opposed to let's say the Southwest, um, in, or places like New Orleans and Louisiana, um, they had to contend with this anti-Catholicism so that they created a uh, American Catholicism that they needed to tap down stuff that they themselves in Ireland practiced. They themselves related to the, the Godhead in ways that were not all that necessarily different from uh, Southern Europeans did. So that was an important aspect of it. Clearly there was a lot going on between the relationship between uh, the Irish who had not only gained control of the church, had gained control of the city, had gained control of the, you know, created and gained control of the police and the firefighters, et cetera. And so they owned the city of New York. And you had four, you know, four million Italians coming into the United States, many of them, most of them settling here, and who were working for the Irish. We hear countless stories of uh, boxers in particular who take on Irish names because that's the way they can get fights. So that, again, that was a negotiated situation um, that happened. Um, Paul Moses, I don't know if you had Paul Moses here. Yeah. A wonderful, he's written, I forget the name, uh, Love Bet uh, Hate and Love Between Strangers. He's written about the relationship between the Irish and the, the, Irish and the Italians here in New York City. It's a wonderful book um, to pick up on. Thank you.